everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Do Good to Lead Well podcast series. I'm your host, Craig Dowden. Welcome back, 2024, new year, new uh, series of episodes. Really excited to dive in today to the conversation. For those of you who are return listeners to the live event, welcome back. Honored that you take the time out of your hectic schedules to join into the live conversations with top thought leaders. For those of you who are new to the Do Good to Lead Well universe, a very heartfelt welcome. Love having you with us. This series really started before the launch of my first book, Do Good to Lead Well, The Science and Practice of Positive Leadership. And one of the things that I feel most fortunate, most privileged, is I have the extraordinary privilege to speak with CEOs, top thought leaders. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, a couple of years ago, really wanted to open up that conversation and start to talk with top CEOs and best-selling authors, global thought leaders around their insights, their experience, their expertise, their passion for positive leadership and making a difference in organizations. And I just want to acknowledge your tremendous and ongoing support. It's really been an extraordinary year for, for the podcast. We are now ranked in the top 0.5% globally according to listen notes and that could not have happened without your ongoing support feedback sharing ideas please keep it coming and i couldn't think of a more exciting guest to start the new year than stephen m r covey the best-selling author of trust and inspire now i'm going to give a, a high level bio uh cannot we would take the hour just going through everything uh, Stephen is a New York Times and number one Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Speed of Trust and Trust and Inspire. And I have my copy. It is awesome. Numerous thought leaders that I've had on this podcast, those highest respected names that you've heard about have all lent their name to this extraordinary book. He's the former CEO of Covey Leadership Center, which under his stewardship became the largest leadership development company in the world. Stephen personally led the strategy that propelled his father's book, Dr. Stephen R. Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, become one of the two most influential business books of the 20th century, according to CEO Magazine. As president and CEO of Covey Leadership Center, Stephen nearly doubled revenues while increasing profits by 12 times, during that period, the company expanded throughout the world into over 40 countries, greatly increasing the value of the brand and enterprise. The company was valued at 2.4 million when Stephen was named CEO, and within three years, he had grown shareholder value to 160 million in a merger he orchestrated with Franklin Quest to form Franklin Covey. And as I said, this is just a short form overview Stephen, it's just an awesome honor and pr privilege to have you join us. Welcome to the podcast. Wow. Well, well, thank you, Craig. I'm truly delighted to be here with you on this podcast and with our audience and, and uh, love the work that you do and uh, do, do good to lead well and the time to lead. So I feel like uh, we're, we're soulmates on this and of how we approach leadership and really excited for this conversation. So thank you so much. Well, the feeling is mutual, and thank you. Uh, and again, for those of you who have joined us in the past or are new, please chime in with your questions. You can type in your questions. You have the chance to speak with one of the top global thought leaders on leadership and positive leadership. So let's start with, with your book, Trust and Inspire. And as I was sharing beforehand, and I was, you can almost call out any page and you can ask me to go, and I've got my old school highlighter going, it's just jam-packed with insights and actual insights. What prompted you to write Trust and Inspire? Yes. Um, what prompted it was when I was uh, with my uh, father, Dr. Stephen Covey, as you mentioned in the, in the intro, um, before he passed away, we would do these events together. We'd take a day and, and we'd go in and you know, we'd have a big audience, could be 500 to 1,000 people. My dad would take, uh, uh, you know, two-thirds the day. I take the last third. 
And he'd always ask this question. He'd ask people, um, <clears throat> how many of you believe that the vast majority of your workforce has more creativity, ingenuity, capacity, potential, and, and um, an ability to contribute than their current job requires or even allows them to give. And almost every hand in the room would go up. In other words, there's so much more in people that they're not giving. And then the second question would be, and how many of you are under increased pressure to achieve more with less? And again, almost every hand would go up. And you kind of just juxtapose, juxtapose that, that here we got to do more with less, and yet we're not tapping into what people are capable of doing. They have far more to give and to contribute and more potential, more talent, more ingenuity, creativity than they're being allowed to give. And that to me is a leadership crisis, a leadership problem of we are not leading in a way to tap into the potential, the greatness inside of people. And so it was that was when the seed was planted that we've got to lead in a different way. And then over the years, I've kind of framed it around um, what's happening too much is we're still leading out, out of the old model that came out of you know scientific management and what I call command and control. And, and, uh, and we really haven't, where we're trying to contain and control people versus unleashing and releasing their capabilities and their talents and a new way to lead what I call trust and inspire. And, and it kind of, it kind of evolved that a new world of work requires a new way to lead, to tap into this talent and this greatness and, and I started to frame it around the idea of moving from command and control, the way we kind of we've been scripted and grown up with, to trust and inspire. That people don't want to be managed, people want to be led, they want to be trusted, they want to be inspired, and that brings out the best in everyone. So that was the genesis, is doing that work, seeing the, the leadership opportunity in front of people and saying how we lead matters to unleash the potential and the talent that's inside of people. I'll just conclude this thought by saying the, the statement from Mahatma Gandhi. He said, the difference between what we are doing and what we are capable of doing would solve most of the world's problems. Mm. So we've got to tap into that difference and so that we bring out the very best in all of us. That's a leadership opportunity. Well, and I love that, and I love the point that you make at the beginning of the book. There are so many great ideas, and I love how you talk about, Stephen, that despite how much the world has changed, we're basically like using the same model of leadership forever, and, and you and so rightly call it out as command and control, and even you'll say, it's in some cases, enlightened command and control. Exactly. I love that. It's still the same operating principles. Yeah, yeah. The world has changed, but our style of leadership has not, or it's not kept pace with this changing world. And what, but you know, we've improved. We've moved from authoritarian command and control to enlightened command and control, <laughs> which is a better version of it. Um, you know, it's kinder and gentler. It's a better version of it. And it, it taps into a sense of, of mission and, and possibilities, but still the fundamental paradigm of how we view people and how we view leadership hasn't shifted. So it's just kind of different in degree and it's a much better version of it, but it's not different in kind. It's mm. not the sea change that we need of how we view people. You know, we're still trying to manage people and things versus managing things and leading people. Be efficient with things, be effective with people. And you know, it's still kind of motivation oriented versus inspiration. Mm -hmm. oriented, you know, motivation, external, extrinsic, outside of us, carrot and stick, heavy, nothing wrong with it, just incomplete. Yeah. Inspiration is internal, it's intrinsic, it's inside of people. You light the fire within. Mm. Once lit, that fire can burn on for months, if not years, without the need of constant new external stimuli. So, you know, it's just different in kind. So one way of kind of lo looking at this on a continuum is authoritarian command and control, kind of that, that's the more real traditional hierarchical leadership that operates on the premise of fear, mm -hmm. a little bit of what I can do to you. You know, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, I can demote you, fire you, et cetera, fear-based. 
It's not going to be very effective today. Mm -hmm. Enlightened command and control is a much improved. It operates on the premise of fairness and transactional exchange. So it's what I can do for you and you for me. And, you know, that's better, but it's still transactional. It's still in the realm of motivation. Mm -hmm. Fast and Inspire operates on the premise of inspiration, of partnership, and real collaboration. That's what I can do with you. Mm -hmm. so not what I can do to you or even for you, but what I can do with you. We're partners. Mm -hmm. We approach this. I'm tapping in inspiration, not just motivation. And, and there's just opens up to all kinds of new possibilities. And the best leaders are leading this way, especially today when people have so many choices and options of where they can be. And, you know, they want to be at a place where they're trusted, where they're inspired. And they feel like they can become their very best version of themselves. And that also happens to be not only the best for the person, it's also the best for the organization and for the cause, for the mission and purpose. And so it's just a better way to lead in a new world of work. Well, and I love that. And it uh, reminds me, I'd, I'd love to say, you know, doing the right thing is not, th not just the right thing to do for you. It's the right thing to do for your organization. Everybody benefits. And, and I love that idea that you've captured Stephen so beautifully and again I you, you can for those tuning in you can see why I've been so excited I can see people like slowing down the speed of the podcast because there are so many amazing nuggets in there and, and we were talking just before going live and I, I'm going to say this again the book is packed with actionable insights I love that focus that you bring to it it's no surprise it's been so well received it's a mo it's a bestseller on the top, the most highly respected list, because you're able to take those ideas that a lot of us, again, they've been there. And what I love is you shine a light on them and you are you reference the quotes. Your book alone has some of the most amazing collection of quotes. I love that. One idea I want to, I want to get you to speak more about, and there's so many great quotes that you provided in the book. You say, I believe inspiration is the new engagement. And I was like, okay, that is rock star. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. See, we it's interesting. We've been focused on employee engagement for a couple decades now, right? And and um and it seems like we've you know barely moved the needle. I know some <clears throat> some leaders in some organizations have really moved the needle. But collectively, if you look at what's happened is it's still the vast majority of the workforce is still not in, engaged, or at least they're they're partially disengaged, and very few are fully engaged. And and so for all our progress, we still haven't, you know, uh, arrived to where we want to be. But I think that that uh, our our focus there's something beyond engagement. In a sense, engagement is still um, not at the highest level of what's possible. And so I believe that inspiration, which goes through engagement to get there, but beyond it, is really the either the highest manifestation of engagement. If I want to, I'm not against engagement. We need engagement. So I'm not here to say don't focus on engagement. Of course, we need to continue to focus on engagement. But really, what if we move towards inspiring our people and our team? Are they inspired? You know, Microsoft measures this as are they thriving? And you know, not just engaged, but thriving. Are they inspired? And and I believe that's the new engagement, the next frontier of engagement. And there's a study from Bain and Company that shows this: that that inspired employees are 125 percent more productive than merely satisfied employees. Mm -hmm. Now you might expect that, right? Because satisfaction is not a very high high bar. So you might expect that, but listen to this. Inspired employees are also 56% more productive than fully engaged employees. Wow. There's something beyond engagement where it's not just, you know, is this, you know, am I giving discretionary effort, but do I feel a sense of purpose and meaning and contribution and a sense of caring and belonging as part of this? There's another frontier both of productivity for the organization, but also for the person, for the individual, 
well-being, mm. joy, happiness, that thriving. And so it's better for the organization. It's better for the individual. And they want, they're going to thrive and they want to be there. And that's the, the idea that inspiration is the new engagement, or at least maybe, you know, it's so that, so that I don't, I don't want to downplay engagement. Maybe put it this way. Inspiration is the highest manif manifestation of engagement. Well, and I love how you, you know, how you frame that. And one thing I have to say throughout reading the book, and you'll talk about command and control, enlightened command and control. One of the things I feel as, as I was reading it, you just do such an amazing job of not stepping on other things or downgrading other things to make that those these great points you're making it's about okay how do we aspire to the highest version of ourselves the highest impact the most amazing contribution that we can make personally individually and then collectively i've got a question right away i'm not surprised uh from andrea who said wow i've taken so many notes in the first few minutes of this podcast one thing you said I want to hear more about manage things, lead people. Can you talk more about that? Absolutely. See, sometimes we, you know, we, we've kind of talked about the difference between management and leadership really over 50 years. Started with Abraham Zelesnik and many others, uh, Cotter and, and, and many others through the years. And so I'm trying to make this point. They're both good. It's not either or um, it's just the context matters. We want to manage things, but we want to lead people. But sometimes we've gotten so good at management that we start to manage people as if they were things. And I'll tell you what, we do that today. We start to manage people like things. At some point, we might end up with no people and a lot of things. <laughs> Because they, you know, they're going to go elsewhere. They have choices. They have options. People don't want to be managed, mm -hmm. but people do want to be led. Mm. And they want to be trusted. They want to be inspired. So again, it's not either or. It's and. It's just contextual. Manage things. Lead people. Be, you know, management of things is efficient. We need efficiency. It's a good thing for things. But with people, effectiveness is better. Be efficient with things. Be effective with people. The moment we try to be efficient with people, we lose our effectiveness. And so that's the idea <clears throat> is that both we need both good management and good leadership. And the key is bring the context into it. And because it's very easy to start to become so good at management that we manage people as if they were things. So it's not either or, it's and. Manage things, lead people. Efficient with things, effective with people. That mindset enables us to move forward and be the best in both frontiers. The best at management, the best at leadership. So we manage systems and structures and processes. We manage strategies. We manage inventories. We manage the financials. Manage the sales process. Manage the business. Manage things, but lead people. Mm, I love that. I've got so many positive comments. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, awesome. Love the energy. Great examples. And what I really appreciate, again, that what you do, Stephen, throughout is you call us out, challenge us around false dichotomies, where you say, okay, look, let us it's the end. You're not sacrificing yeah. one for the other. These things go together exponentially. Leverage the power. Don't look at them as detractors. Look at them as additives. Absolutely. It's again back to that Jim Collins idea, the genius of the end, and avoiding the dichotomous either or thinking, because uh, we need good management of things. We also need great leadership of people. So embrace the end, the genius of the end. Manage things, lead people is a great way to embody both. And and, uh, and so yeah, throughout this, I try to. I'm not trying to denigrate the progress that we've made. I'm just trying to say the world has changed all around us. And, and I know, um, you know, you begin your, your time to lead with the idea of this VUCA world that's going to become even more VUCAized, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. The world has changed. 
and it's changing all around us. And our style of leadership needs to catch up with that changing world. And I'm suggesting that in this new world of work, that trust and inspire versus command and control is just such a better way of leading people. And what is going to bring out the best, the capabilities, the talents that's inside of people so that we close those gaps and, and become the best version of ourselves and tap into what's possible. And I and again, I and I love that idea. It's something that just resonates so strongly with me is how do we inspire ourselves to be the best version of ourselves? What are the things that we can do? And then also inspire the best in others. Another question, again, these are just rapid fire coming through. Love the perspective, Anil said, love the perspective. What are some of the key indicators that tell a leader or organization that we are making the leap from engaged leadership to inspired leadership? Yeah, beautiful question, Anil. Um, you know, they include looking at things of are people truly tapping into a sense of purpose, mm -hmm. meaning, and contribution. And, and um, see, uh, when, when you're doing that, then it's it's more than just I'm here um, because it's a job and, and I'm doing my best at it. We everyone wants everyone wants to do that, but there's a sense of significance about what we're doing, a purpose and meaning. And you talk about this in in uh, um, you know do good to lead well, meaning and purpose, and the idea of purpose, meaning and contribution. That's one good indicator. Another good indicator is the sense of caring mm. and and uh, some people even call it love but you know caring genuine caring that people feel like my leader cares about me and in our, in our culture people care about each other and so it's not just that we're engaged and giving discretionary effort we are but we're doing it in a culture and a climate of genuine caring and i feel that caring and i also in addition to caring i feel a sense of belonging mm. I belong to this team i belong to this organization this culture this cause and and i feel a part of it part of my identity is tied to this mm. and that really taps into a level of inspiration that's just quite you know remarkable and mm. and um um so you know, those are a couple of good indicators of am I tapping into purpose, meaning, and contribution? Am I tapping into caring? Am I mm -hmm. tapping into a sense of belonging? And and um, that go, you know, and then it's all the other things of engagement, which are all good mm -hmm. that we need to, to give that discretionary effort. And and um, and I'm also have a sense of belonging, a sense of caring, and a sense of purpose and meaning and contribution. It takes us to a whole different level you know it's interesting i was with them um, it just shows you the power of this purpose meaning contribution i was with uh, pepperdine university mm. and um great university uh, in in uh, southern california and their graziato school of business um here's their purpose had been to produce leaders who are best in the world and that's a good purpose right i mean produce leaders who are best in the world and then they changed one word and really went from engaging everyone to inspiring everyone when they changed it to our purpose is to produce leaders who are best for the world. Mm. For the world leaders. Right. Suddenly, it's not just that, you know, and by the way, to be best for the world leaders, I got to be pretty good in the world too to do that. But <laughs> yeah. the mindset of best for the world leaders, I moved from being engaged to inspired. Everyone was inspired from the professors to the staff members to the janitor. They were producing best for the world leaders. That's mm. tapping into purpose, meaning, and contribution. And I believe that you can create and embed purpose, meaning, and contribution into almost any role and into almost any organization if you're careful and thoughtful about this and if it's truly part of who you are as an organization you're trying to co-purpose overlapping 
organizational purpose, individual purposes. You help people find their why, and tap into that too. So there's a sense of, you know, they have their purpose. You're, you're tapping into their why. They find their why and we overlap it with our why. You're mm -hmm. co-purposing together. That's really powerful. So that's maybe, Anil, a way of thinking about, about this, of really moving from engagement to, to the highest manifestation of inspiration. Well, and again, so many amazing comments on that and words, inspirational words of meaning, contribution, significance, belonging, caring, love. And, and it reminds me again, it's why I love being part of this, these kinds of conversations, Stephen. It reminds me of, of Alan, the, my collaborator on, on A Time to Lead. And at the center of the working together management system is a heart with people first, love them up and i love that you shine the light on that so powerfully and again it just shows how important that is and another piece that i want to share with you uh, that and and to the live audience as well throughout the book what really struck me as i was going through are expressions like what you were just sharing best for the world versus in the world the intentionality that you bring to ideas that we may have heard before, it's turns of phrase that we use, so important. And you just highlighted that beautifully with the Pepperdine example, where just that subtle shift now opens up a whole world, new world of possibility and potential for us. Yes, absolutely. You know, our words matter, language matters. And, and even most of the language we have in business is coming from the command and control model, you know, mm. chain of command, you know, span of control. Uh, Bob Chapman talks about not span of control, but span of care. Mm. Instead of span of control, what a different mindset of you know. What's your span of control here? Again, that's the that's the command and control paradigm of people are things and fungible, <laughs> replaceable. It's not people first, okay. but how about span of care mm. the paradigm shift in that very word from span of control to span of care again bob chapman is the one that is that initiated that thinking i just love it because so much changes in that very construct and and um um because you can have a paradigm shift itself of you now how i view things differently i'm a steward mm. you know that's another one i make about leadership is that a fundamental belief of a trust and inspire leader is that leadership is stewardship. See, it's not about rights. It's about responsibilities. It's not about position. It's about influence. And so when I see it that way, that leadership is stewardship, my, I'm a steward as a leader. I'm not a boss. I'm a steward. And, and um, for those that I lead and serve, and so then my job as a leader, you know, is to now put service above self-interest. Mm -hmm. The irony is in the process, self-interest is served. But my whole mindset is to, you know, put service above self-interest. I have a little mantra for that. Seek to bless, not to impress. Mm, it's a way that. to kind of operationalize what you're doing. I, and I try to do that every time I, I give a presentation. Or, or I'm on a podcast like today. I did this before. I go through a few rituals myself to prepare my heart and my mind, which is a big part of how you, what you espouse, you know, the mastering yourself and, you know, emotionally and mentally and your mindsets and, and, um, and, and your resilience and so forth. And so for me, I try to get my mindset into what's my purpose here? Am I trying to impress people? Mm -hmm. Am I trying to bless people? I think to bless not to impress, put service above self-interest. Such a better way to lead. It's true leadership because I'm now mm -hmm. a steward. So I do think that language matters, as as do systems and structures. And and you know we're but we're and we're still so much in kind of a command and control world. It's in our language, in our systems, in our structures. And 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 yet I think most people really want to be trust and inspire leaders. But it's That's very easy nice. for our style to get in the way of our intent. And we're in some ways we're, we're swimming upstream. So I try to lay out how we become trust and inspire leaders and, and you know, in a world of command and control. That's the idea. 
Well, and and again, so many positive comments on that, and 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 I love how you're talking about that intentionality, and and how depending on how we describe things, depending on how we the words we use, how that impacts the things we say, the things we do, and the impact that we have not only on ourselves on others as well. So many questions coming in, and so this is great. Uh, Isabel wrote, so inspiring. I just want to rush to the bookstore now. <laughs> Uh, a common obstacle pertains to span of control, so building on this, deemed somewhat more difficult to trust and inspire in that context. So any tips on how to make that happen? How can you be a trust and inspire leader in an environment that's kind of focused on span of control? Yeah, yeah. Well, the interesting thing is that um, you don't have to wait on anybody else, mm. even if... Uh, even if your boss is command and control, you can model what trust and inspire looks like and, and show a better way to lead and to operate with, with uh, your people, your team, or if you're not the leader of the team, as a team member even. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you can be a model. We need models who can become mentors. We need to show that there's a better way of doing this because a lot of people are just kind of saying, hey, this, you know, the way, the way we do things here is how we get stuff done. And so, we might say, yeah, but there's another way that we can maybe do this and get those same things done actually a little bit better and bring the people with us, improve the culture, the relationships. And again, your friend, Alan Mulally, it's a great illustration. And, he, and again, his language, working together, yes. management system. That's a trust inspired, that's a with, working yeah. together. It's not, I'm the boss, you're my direct reports, hierarchical. It's working together. That's very much trust and inspire, and and um, so so uh, yes, it, that I acknowledge that that uh, that there might be command and control elements all around us, but we can be a model of trust and inspire, and mm -hmm. we can use our influence as a model to become a mentor and begin to ripple out, and you'll be amazed at how much influence you can have. I'll tell you a little short story on this one. We worked with an organization that was kind of traditional hierarchical command and control. They were enlightened command and control. They're good people, and 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 um, you know good practices for the most part. But still, it was a little bit out of the old paradigm. And and uh, we had a leader within um, HR that caught the vision of of really trust and inspire. And rather than kind of saying, well, gosh, we've got command and control everywhere, and command and control bosses, this person, this lady, Janita, she said, I'm going to just lead out. And we're going to lead out in our team. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to lead out me personally and with my team. I'm going to go first. See, someone needs to go first. Leaders go first. So she built a trust and inspire team, trust and inspire culture. Now, because she was over HR, her team, HR, worked with all the other operating uh, divisions because they were partners with them. And they became Trust and Inspire partners because they had a Trust and Inspire team th themselves. And those operators that were working with their, their HR partner, they saw a different way of working together. They experienced it firsthand. And a lot of them started to say, hey, it's fantastic to work with you. Your whole approach is so good. What, how you, what are you doing? And they said, well, we found a better way to lead mm. and to operate. And they began to be influenced by that. And they started to talk to each other. And then pretty soon they went to the CEO of the company. And they, you know, one by one, he started to notice that these operators, most, you know, not every single one of them, but most of them were starting to operate in a different way. Mm -hmm. And and uh, ultimately the CEO kind of got caught the vision of, of a better way to lead. And then the and once the CEO caught the vision, uh, he took this uh, approach to literally everyone in the whole company. And so I've had some people say, gosh, I wish we had a CEO like that that got the vision for this. And my reaction is, it didn't start with the CEO. It started with Janita, working within her circle of influence, working from the inside out, modeling this herself, building a trust-inspired team and culture, having that trust-inspired team and culture model it with their interactions. And those people then 
and that influence spreading till ultimately it goes to the CEO. He catches the vision through what he sees and then with that adopts it for the whole company. So yes, we'd love to have that kind of CEO, but you can model it wherever you stand and ultimately help bring about this ripple effect, impact and influence. So don't underestimate what we can do. And by the way, that could be true whether you're in a leadership role or not, it could because leadership is a is a choice, not a position. If we're all leading, whatever world, and we lead in our homes and in our communities, in the neighborhoods, and we need this. The key to becoming a trust inspired leader is to first become a trust and inspire person. Mm -hmm. And I know yeah. that's what you're all about, because <laughs> you know who we are matters. Mm -hmm. Well, and thank you. This is awesome. And again, it, it, uh, the quote, it reminds me, you know, be the change you want to see in the world yes. and, uh, and, and lead. You, you talk about this and I love that idea. Well, what do trust and inspire leaders do? They go first. Uh, yep. And, and also love the point you just made as well, because I'll, I'll, I'll say to people as well, we're all the CEOs of our lives. And so that is, and ultimately that comes down to how we're choosing to lead and engaging in all the different environments and all the different people with whom we interact. And I love it. And there's so many comments coming in. I do want to highlight a couple of them. So in particular, uh, thank you. I love your answer. So empowering. And then also words matter. I'll have to realign my language to reflect my true intent. Absolutely yeah. awesome. Again, beautifully said. So thank you for that comment. There's another question, again, not surprised. I knew this was gonna be a floodgate of questions, which is great. Uh, so Catherine was wondering, what about leaders that are struggling to inspire in the hybrid work environment? What would you advise them uh, when, when they have teams spread across geographical locations and also joining through a hybrid uh, uh, world? Yes. Catherine, good question, because this is affecting most of us, probably increasingly, you know, in this hybrid world, we're probably not, you know, the, pan the pandemic accelerated everything. There's been some move back, but, but we're probably more in a new world of work where the workplace has changed. There is on-site work and there is completely remote work and there's a lot of hybrid work and intentionally flexible work. And it's going to increase. But I think in particular um, with hybrid work and remote work that it actually puts a greater premium on becoming trust and inspire. Whereas mm -hmm. the tendency might be to become a little bit more command and control because, Hey, I can't see people or, you know, they're, they're often remote and, and therefore I, I get into an efficiency mindset, but that's why we have to be more deliberate, more intentional about being trust and inspire. And about um, you know clarifying um, expectations and building an agreement together, mm -hmm. so that we can be accountable together. You know, very much aligned with the working together management system that you describe with mm -hmm. Alan. And you know, we're building the agreement together with expectations, with accountability. See, a trust inspired leader um, builds it together. A command and control leader dictates the agreement. It says. Hey, here's what you're going to do, and and I'll judge you based upon this. A command, a trust, inspire leader builds it together with clear expectations about around the results and the guidelines and the resources, and then they build the process of accountability together against those expectations. They build the agreement, so now the agreement governs, and I don't need to hover over and micromanage people because we built an agreement, and and they can lead themselves against the agreement and report back on how they're doing. And they feel empowered, but we haven't lost the sense of control because the control is in the agreement okay. that, that we built together, as opposed to you don't build that agreement together. And now you're responsible to hover over and micromanage and making sure that they're doing their work. Mm -hmm. And the locus of control never has shifted to giving them the responsibility. You still own it in a way that you, you feel like, Hey, I have to, make sure that they're doing this. And so they feel like they're being micromanaged. You feel like you're just making sure the work's being done, but you didn't build the agreement together. So I think especially in remote en environments, it puts an actual greater premium on the need to 
kind of go through these this process of becoming intentionally trust and inspire mm -hmm. and and um and really focusing on building that sense of belonging it's harder in a hybrid situation in a remote situation so you've got to work at it and building that sense of care and concern again you have to work at it more intentionally because you're you don't have always that same proximity and and same with expectations same with accountability same with building the agreement but the same principles are at play just mm. a greater premium on the need for intentionality and being explicit and deliberate about what you're doing and why you're doing it always give the why behind the what declare your intent declare yourself who you are i learned that from doug conant our <laughs> friend a mutual friend yeah that's, well and and again so many amazing comments here and I want to acknowledge and that brilliant insight you just made uh, in terms of hybrid work. What's the natural reflex? And you see it, you look at headlines in all the major business journals and publications around the world. It's like, okay, I'm going to be more controlling. I'm going to monitor more closely. I need to tighten my grip. And I love what you just shared, Stephen, which is no. In fact, what we want to do is go like we want to lean in more into trust and inspire leadership. This environment demands it more, not less. This is the ideal context in which to put these principles into practice. I think Precisely. That's, and and the other thing I, I want to share too, because I love, I, I'm so glad you talked about this, because in the book as well, and 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 I discussed this earlier. You break it down. And one of the things that I love, you say, okay, so trust is great. And you make an incredible business case for the power of trust. And then you say, well, how does that work? How do we operationalize that? And you mentioned about the importance, and, and as you just did, clarifying those expectations that are co-created. And then there's accountability that comes with that as well. Absolutely. So, so and those are the ingredients of, of a trusting relationship. And to share trust. And now with that, we have this dynamic duo where we can accomplish anything, once again, borrowing from Alan, by working together. I've got other comments, questions coming in. Uh, and uh, Scott said, this is so inspiring. And sadly, I have to admit, I have difficulty delegating and letting go. Uh, you've inspired me to be a trust and inspire. Any tips or techniques to help me move from <laughs> delegate more? Yeah, that this is, you know, to to Scott's point, this is one of the key barriers. I I, I devote a whole third of the book to the the common barriers to becoming trust and inspire. Because at one level, we all get this kind of like this is almost common sense, but it's not common practice. We're still in a very much command and control world, but also <clears throat> because of all these changes in the workplace, the workforce, you know, as many as five generations at work and these younger generations, Gen Z, millennials, and the upcoming alpha generation have completely different expectations of how they want to be engaged. They're not going to tolerate some of the ways that we've led in the past. And, and so we've got to lead in a new way. And, um, but there's barriers that kind of get in the way of, Sometimes it's kind of like, hey, I like these ideas, but this won't work here. <laughs> not with my boss, not at our company, not in our industry. We're a very compliance-based industry. And I'm saying, no, you can actually be trust and inspire even in command and control industries. You can be a model of this. This is not soft or weak. This is strong. Trust and inspire leader is strong without being forceful. You can be authoritative without being authoritarian. You can be detail oriented without being distrusting because you do it through the agreement you build together and you can be in charge and have control without being controlling. So there's a really a third alternative. You build this agreement together, but, but the one that Scott mentioned of, I have a hard time letting go. It's true for a lot of us and, and uh, our intent is good, but because we're responsible, it's, it's hard to really let go. And I think the key to being able to quote, let go, is the idea of I'm just shifting the 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 locus of control from myself being the one that's governing to the person around the agreement we build together, but there's still control. Mm -hmm. It's just 
I, the control is built into the agreement we are building together as opposed to me keeping it and therefore I'm judging you and evaluating you and the person feels I'm being micromanaged. You haven't let go. You're not, you know, you don't trust me. And you might feel like I do trust you, but I got to make sure I know all these facts and that this is happening and being done. Build the agreement. I call these stewardship agreements with clarifying expectations, practicing accountability into the agreement. And when you get really good at that, you realize, wow, I can really let go and trust people. Mm -hmm. Still, there's control there still. And here's what you also will find. The research shows that people perform better when they're trusted. Mm -hmm. I know I do. I bet you do, Craig. <laughs> I bet our listeners do. People perform better. Research shows about three times better. Rise to the occasion. Brings out the very best in others. And they reciprocate and return the trust. When you trust people, they tend to trust you back. And when you don't trust them, they tend to not trust you either. So it is hard to let go. Yeah. And, and especially if that's kind of been your style, that you're really detail-oriented or very much, you know, know everything that's happening. I'm suggesting there's a third alternative. It's not either or. Mm -hmm. It's an and. Again, I look at it this way. In a sense, the opposite of trust and inspire is not command and control. Mm -hmm. I think the opposite of, well, the other way around, the opposite of, of uh, you know, command and control is not trust and inspire. I think trust and inspire is a third alternative. The opposite mm -hmm. of command and control, we might call abdicate and abandon. Right. See, if command and control is excessively hands-on, just hands-on, almost suffocating, micromanaging, the opposite is abdicated and abandoned. That's excessively hands off. There's mm -hmm. no leadership there, no expectation, no accountability. That's not going to work. Trust and inspire is a third alternative. That's hand in hand. Yes. That's working together. That's mm -hmm. with. And so it's a third alternative of being strong without being forceful and, and, and really um, leading this way. And, and so you can get better results. And, and bring your people along better and they have more, they, they grow because we're always trying to do two things. We're trying to get the job done, get the result, but we also want to grow people. Mm. And then when we do that, the ability to get results in the future has just gone up. Plus people are happier mm. and because the growth is a big part of why they, what they want from their job to grow, to become the best version of themselves. And so, but we got to get the job done again, not either or and. Get results in a way that grows people through the mm -hmm. agreement we build together. And you'll get better results, three times better. <laughs> and you will grow the people. And that's what leadership is all about. Absolutely. And thank you again. So many great comments coming through. And I love another just shining example of, and, and I love that you dedicated such a, a solid portion of the book to that about, okay, what are the challenges? So let's just be open about what hesitations there are. And again, I love how you approach it. It's like no judgment, totally understandable. And, and now let's work through it. And what I love about that example, and thank you, Scott, for that question is around, hey, well, the fear is I'm going to give up control. I'm going to abandon. I'm not going to be able to engage. I won't be able to support. So it's all hands off. And what I love that what you're talking about, Stephen, is say, no, we are working together. We're working yeah. with each other. It's shared control because we each have influence about where we want to go. So let's map that out together in a way that we're truly inspired. We're clear on the direction, why we're going there, how we're going to get. And now we can run off and have a lot of fun and be fully engaged and benefit from all the great uh, consequences that you just shared in the research that comes from this uh, from this style. Absolutely. And I'll add one last little piece to that. There's actually, it's almost ironic, but there's actually more control in a trust and inspire culture than there is in a command and control culture. Mm. You, you know, you can't come up with enough rules for people who you don't trust. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's just too many openings, but you build a high trust culture that inspires people. Then the culture itself becomes your greatest asset. Mm. And, and the violators to that, the culture spits them out. It doesn't allow it versus you having to put in more rules and more regulations and policies and procedures that just weigh everybody else down. And too often we design our organizations and our teams for the, 
for the five percent of the people that we can't trust, not for the ninety-five percent of the people that we can. And mm. we penalize the many because of the few. Far better to to to, to lead out with where people are at, what we can build together, and let the culture then become what weeds out, crowds out, starves out the violators and the, and the offenders versus the other way around, where we penalize the many because of the few. And I love that idea, and I think it's so important to recognize, because once we've really committed to that process and built that high trust and inspire culture that you're talking about, Stephen, and now that just kind of takes care of itself, because people who don't want to align with that, well, they kind of find their way outside, and those that are interested in joining and they start to learn about this. No, this, this, this isn't for me. So it's the ultimate self-selection tool. Uh, I can't believe how fast the time has gone by. We will not cover all of the questions. And so I've got, uh, we've got a, a, a boatload more. We will, uh, uh, again, I will do my best. I've got a great question from Mike who said, wow, I was so inspired by your discussion around hybrid. And I feel I really mistrusted my team. I received feedback. I was confused by it. I feel I broke trust with them. I was micromanaging. How can I rebuild that trust? Yeah. Then de declare your intent. Own it. Mm -hmm. And take responsibility. And you know, you're being vulnerable. You're real. You just say, you know what? I realize now that I probably came across as distrusting because of how I kind of stepped in on there and I realized I didn't build the agreement enough. It's on me. I want to trust you. And I want to also, we, we've got to do this together. So we've got to build the agreement together better. And that's on me. I'm going to go first. So let's, let's try it again. Give me another opportunity. Cause I do believe in you and I trust you. It's just amazing what those words mean to people. You know, it was Blaise Pascal who says, I give you the, I give you the gift of these four words. I believe in you. Mm. And a great way of manifesting that is to say, I trust you. Mm. And sometimes people might say that, but people might feel like, well, you say that, but your actions show that you don't. Right. And that's where you want to make sure that your style is aligned with your intent. Mm. And But what gets in the way of that is we just want to make sure the job gets done. So build the agreement together up front. And working together, building the agreement together enables us to extend more trust. And here's what's interesting, Craig and, and Mike. That, uh, you could have two trustworthy people working together, both trustworthy, and yet no trust between them if neither person is willing to extend trust to the other, to give it. So if we want trust, a high trust team, high trust culture, high trust relationship, to get that, yes, we have to be trustworthy. We earn that. That's who we are. But we also need to be trusting. Mm. We give that. And I find that the bigger gap, more often than not, is not that people aren't trustworthy, although sometimes that's the issue. It's more often that we're not trusting enough as leaders. Mm. And it's because we're afraid to lose control and maybe if, what if it doesn't work? We've got to get better at building that agreement together so we can become more trusting with each other. And mm. that's what's going to unleash and ignite people. And can I just make this, I know we're close to the very end here. Oh, yeah. I want to just highlight one thing that um, in the book I talk about, there's three stewardships in becoming a trust-inspired leader. It's modeling, trusting, and inspiring. Mm. Modeling is who we are. So we model. That's your character, it's your competence, it's your credibility. We model, and you get this so well, it's who we are. Trusting is how we lead. We lead out in trusting people. Inspiring is connecting to why, to why it matters. So a trust inspired leaders, they model, they trust, they inspire. Those are stewardships we have, responsibilities mm -hmm. we have as a leader to model for our people, for our team, to trust them so we bring out the best in them and to inspire them. The idea is that inspiring others is a learnable skill. Everyone can inspire. And too often we've kind of conflated charisma with inspiration, thinking you got to be charismatic to inspire. No, everyone can inspire. It's a learnable skill. They're different. 
-hmm. And how do you inspire? You inspire when you model the behavior. You inspire when you trust people. And you inspire when you connect with people through a sense of caring and belonging. And when you connect to purpose and to meaning and to contribution, that will inspire. We can learn to inspire others. We can get good at this. So we model, we trust, we inspire. Look at what Satya Nadella has done and is doing at Microsoft. When he came in, you know, the Microsoft culture at the time was kind of losing talent, not innovative, cutthroat, competitive internally. He comes in, he's a completely different kind of leader. Humble, you know, back to your six pillars and, and you know, do good to lead well. Humble, empathy, another one of your pillars. Empathic. He modeled. He, he, he went first. He trusted. He moved from a management mindset to a coaching mindset. He inspired through caring and through purpose. He modeled, he trusted, and inspired. He unleashed the greatness of his organization by first unleashing the greatness of his people. And their stock price went from 36, I think it's at 370 today. So it's, you know, again, it's unleashing the greatness that's inside of the organization because he does it with his people first through his leadership. Cheryl Batchelder did this at Popeyes. She turned around Popeyes after four CEOs in the prior seven years. She comes in, she modeled, she trusted, she inspired, unleashed the capabilities of the workforce, and they had a huge turnaround there from 11 to 79, their stock price. I just use the stock price to show you it's a real world example, but the culture, everything else goes along with that. And that was more meaningful to them. You know, you model, you trust, you inspire. You can get good at this. There are leaders that are doing this. Alan Malawi clearly does this and many, many others. And you, listener, can be that kind of leader wherever you stand. So mm -hmm. that's my that's the opportunity in front of us. Well, and thank you. And again, so many amazing comments and, and love your passion, your energy. And that's just been uh, mentioned time and time again in the comments and the feed. And thank one you. of the things, a, a point that you made that I think is so powerful for us, you said declare our intent and declare ourselves and I think sometimes it's so obvious to us what our intent is, and you touch on this throughout the book, and I think it's so powerful. We can be crystal clear our intent, yet to what extent are others in on that? And by declaring ourselves and declaring our intent, now people see our behavior in context, and that's yep. within our control. And I love that idea and that you challenge us, Stephen, to be the best versions of ourselves by going first. I think that's so cool. And I just, I love everything about the book, the work that you do. As I said, I've got my copy that that is just highlighted everywhere. We are near the end of our time. And just before I will uh, throw it to you for the final, uh, some final comments. But for those of you who are on uh, immediately after this, if you're interested, and I recognize it's gonna be a short turnaround, but it's a dynamic duo today. So at 2.30 Eastern, I have James D. White, the former CEO of John the Juice, and Krista White, father-daughter team who wrote an exceptional book, Anti-Racist Leadership. So if you're interested, you can send me a direct email today and I will send you the registration link. And then next week, we have Scott Osman and Jacqueline Lane, the best-selling authors of Becoming Coachable, another fantastic book written by uh, our friend Marshall Goldsmith with Marshall Goldsmith. Stephen, this has just been amazing. Uh, just We could keep going and going. I love your passion for this, your insight, the, the reference to the research, and how you it just emanates out of you in terms of your mission to have a positive impact on the world and through leaders. Any final things you want to share as we close uh, this time together? It's just been an absolute blessing for me. It's been great. Well, thank you, Craig. And it has been for me, too. I love the work that you're doing and the impact. We are aligned on this. And so my concluding thought would simply be what you just mentioned right before um, uh, this, turning this back to me, that Trust Inspire leaders go first. So rather than waiting on everybody else, if you want to see more openness and more transparency, be the first to demonstrate openness and transparency. If you want to see more and feel more empathy, be the first to be empathic. If you want to see um, more respect and, and demonstrate it, be the first 
to demonstrate respect. You want more trust? Be the first to give trust and be trustworthy yourself. You go first. Leaders go first. Somebody needs to go first. And the great thing about that is it's inside out. We don't have to wait on anybody else. And we need models who can become mentors. And you can be the model. You can become mentors to others. And we can help bring about a better world. We need this. We live in a world that's dangerously low in both trust and inspiration. So we got to counteract it. And we need it not only in our organizations and in our teams. We need it in our, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in our society. And we need examples and models like the Alan Malawis of the world and the, and the Craig Dowdens of the world. We need to go first, and each of us can be that. We can go first and show a better way to lead in this new world of work. Well, and thank you. And I couldn't think of a better a mic drop uh, quote to end this in terms of, and especially the timing at the beginning of the year, let's think about what change do we want to see in the world? What would make 2024 our best year yet? And then go out and be first. Uh, take that take that leap. So Stephen, thank you so, so much for an amazing conversation. As I said, there's just comments keep flowing in. Uh, it's just such an amazing book and love your work. And to everyone, look forward to seeing you soon on the next episode of Do Good to Lead Well. Until then, bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.